Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report. Corey and Chad here chatting with John Rabino. You can follow John on his sub stack, which we will link to below. John, you sent us over a handful of topics that we can discuss here. We are going to focus mostly on some of these market topics, and we are going to start with the precious metals and gold. Gold continuing to trade above $2,000. However, look, there has been a little bit of weakness to start this year, but that goes hand in hand with, it seems like almost every sector when we turned over the calendar after what was a very strong couple month run into the end of the year. Everything's shown a little bit of weakness right now in the futures market. Gold trading about two thousand and thirty-five dollars. John, what are you watching most pro- most closely for the gold price in terms of where it needs to hold? Any key levels that you think investors broadly are focused on? Hey, Corey. Hey, Shad. Well, uh, let me start by saying that the, the long-term outlook for gold is phenomenal. You know, we're we're taking on massive amounts of debt at every level of every major society and printing all the new currency that it takes to cover that debt. Yada, yada. You know, everybody knows that story and it's great for precious metals. So five to $10,000 gold is completely believable three to five years out there. Um, having said that, the question of what it's going to do in the short run is different, you know, because that's that's a, a trading question. And we've been talking about on this show um, whether 2000 is support or resistance for gold. And for the longest time, 2000 US dollars an ounce has been resistance. Gold has crept up there, banged its head on 2000 and gotten smacked back down. That happened like four times in the past three years. And then finally it broke through 2000 in, in you know, a semi-sustainable way. It's been up there for a while. Um, as you said, it's something like 235 or something right now. And um, so the question is, can it stay above 2000? You know, because if it breaks back down, one more bad day and it's back below 2000. And then we're talking about 2000 as re- resistance again. But if it stays up above 2000 and say it goes down and then bounces off of it once or twice, then we can start thinking of 2000 as support. And psychologically, that's a very big deal. You know, it's not mathematically that different, you know, between um, 1990 and 2030 or anything that that's you know, marginally better on the high side for anybody who um, mines gold or deals in it or whatever. But uh, it's psychologically very different if it stays in the 2000s because people then start thinking of 2000 as the floor and start looking at resistance up above that to 2100 or 2500 or whatever. And that means when you're thinking in those terms, that means you can build in that higher number for gold when you're thinking about what the cash flow is going to be for a, a given gold producer or what the uh, the net present value of a resource is for an explorer. And, and all of a sudden, the numbers get kind of big and interesting, right? So one thing that will help as we go on is we'll have a couple of earnings seasons and the producing miners will probably do a little better than expected if gold stays above 2000 because uh, the margins will be a little wider. And so we'll get some pleasant surprises from the, the gold miners in their earnings reports. At the same time, gold stays above 2000 and people start um, thinking in terms of um, 2000 support and 2500 or whatever resistance. So it, you, know, you get a much more um, favorable environment for gold if those things happen and let gold stay above 2000 for a while and the earnings will come through and it, it will happen, you know, so that's possible. <laughs> so no guarantees. And it, it, none of this really matters three to five years out because gold is going to be a beneficiary of the currency crisis. That's inevitable at this point, but in the next year or two, um, it would be really good for our mining stocks if gold stays above 2000. Yeah, John, boy, it sure would. And it would also be good for those folks at Costco that were buying gold at 1800 and 1900 <laughs> to be in the money on their purchases. But to your point, it looks like this time, unlike prior attempts, it's been able to hold the level and keep it a lot longer. It wasn't just a, a fleeting moment. It's actually held it on some monthly charts, on some weekly charts. So that is constructive. But you bring up a great point about the mining stocks and how their margins should start seeing margin expansion now versus the narrative we've had over the last year of margin contraction, really the last couple of years. 
And so if we see an increase in the metals price, if we do see gold eclipse 2100 again and get up to the 2200, 2300, but inflation has moderated and fuel cost and oil has come down, do you anticipate more analysts, more general analysts, just looking at the math and saying, hey, these, these gold companies are set up to have some pretty fat margins here? You would think so. You know, you, you would think that'd be the kind of thing they're building into their um, analyses right now. But if they don't, especially on the sell side, you, you never know what to expect from those analysts. But um, even if they don't bring it up soon, the earnings reports, you know, assuming the fundamentals are what they think they, uh, that we think they are, then the earnings reports will take care of it for us. You know, the Newmonts and, and uh, the Agnico Eagles will, will put out good numbers that'll generate some headlines. And all of a sudden, um, the gold mining industry will be um, operationally attractive. So, you know, that, that'll come with, with the price staying where it is. And, um, yeah, the, the other thing that you mentioned is that energy is not the big deal, not the really big problem that it has been for the, the mining stocks for the past few years. Um, oil is, I think it was like 70 or $69 a barrel U.S. this morning. And um, Adam Taggart had um, Doomberg, uh, which, who's an energy analyst, um, on his show the other day, and and uh, Doomberg had some really shocking things to say about the oil market. He said that um, their their new analysis indicates that, that there's actually a lot more oil and oil equivalents in the world that are accessible now uh, than was the case until pretty recently. And if that's true, then there's going to be downward price pressure due to supply um, in the oil market going forward. And, uh, you know, there, there can always be a war or something like that that gives us $200 a barrel oil. But purely operationally, there's kind of a headwind now for oil, and it's liable to be lower than we think going forward. Well, if that's true, that's good for the miners. So then now we've got two reasons to think that um, mining cash flow ought to be better than it has been lately. Um, and that's a really attractive story. When you've got multiple things going right for an industry at the same time, um, it, it's really easy to make a buy case for those stocks and to raise price targets and things like that. All the things that happen in a bull market, you know. So uh, we, we could easily see an environment like that when these ideas kind of take hold and become the conventional wisdom. So that's a uh, you know mid-year to later in 2024 thing probably, which isn't that far away in the scheme of things. So th this could be a an, good year of positive trends for the precious metals companies. So, John, do you think if investors take more of a look at gold, even if, let's say, uh, markets continue to do fairly well, because we have this guest on who talks about one universal chart where a lot of these sectors have moved together, what do you think truly separates the gold stocks? Is it the fact that they just haven't moved as much as some of these other sectors and we have seen this general rotation and why wouldn't money rotate into a sector where the stocks seem to have underperformed the underlying commodity or underlying price of its good? Well, that might be the third positive factor for the, the gold and silver miners is that they're really cheap while a lot of other sectors are emphatically not cheap. You know, I think the uh, the overall P.E. ratio on the, the S&P 500 is in the, the mid to low 20s right now, which is really high historically. And for a lot of sectors within the S&P 500, it's way higher. So if you're looking around for value plays, there really aren't that many beyond the commodity space. You know, you've seen that chart of commodities versus the S&P 500, right? Commodities are incredibly low, historically low, versus the overall stock market right now. So they're they're cheap, and they are potentially operationally doing well. Although you know every commodity has its own story, because we're we're talking about oil, which may have a little bit of a weaker story now than we expected, and precious metals that are looking pretty good, and uranium, which is looking phenomenal without any reference to the business cycle. You know, uranium should do fine, whatever the economy is doing otherwise. So each commodity has a separate story. Um, but if you lump them all together into that chart, commodities versus the S&P 500, overall, they're pretty cheap. So yeah, you know, this is a this is one of those multi-factor bull market 
theses that uh, you see every once in a while where kind of everything is going the right way. And that doesn't mean it works out. It just means that there's a lot of reasons to think it might work out in the next few years. Well, John, another reason that we see so many markets move in tandem really boils down to two things. What's happening with interest rates and what's happening with the U.S. dollar. And those normally are correlated because interest rates affect the currency, especially in the U.S. So I know it's counterbalanced against the other six uh, global currencies, and they're all a race to the bottom as far as fiat currencies go. But when we look at those two inputs that algorithms use and the trading houses use, if the rates are down and the dollar's down, generally the markets are up, the cryptos are up, the commodities are up, and that definitely affects the monetary metals. As far as how those two assets move, it seems like a lot of that comes down to economic news. And last week on Friday, we did get the non-farms payroll jobs report. We did get the market reaction to that. What's your take on how that'll affect Fed policy moving forward and and the market reaction? Because that ultimately will uh, instruct what happens with interest rates and the currencies. Well, you know, a lot of the government statistics um, that especially those that have been released lately are kind of funny (laughs) because they're they're running a con, basically, where they they'll report an excellent number. And then the um, Washington Post and the New York Times will run headlines about how good the economy is and everything. And then over the, the ensuing couple of months, they'll go back and they'll revise those numbers down to what would be disappointing numbers if they if they came out originally and they were the, the headline stat. Um, and the jobs is maybe jobs numbers are maybe the, the worst offenders there because they do the revision thing. And so you get a good headline number and then revisions so that the jobs market actually looks kind of weak, all things considered. But then there's more with jobs, because if you dig into it, you find out that um, um, that that big jobs number that was reported in the headline includes both full-time and part-time jobs, but the full-time jobs are going away while the number of part-time jobs is spiking. And that's the sign of an unhealthy economy, not a healthy economy. And when you've got people you know, cobbling together three jobs to make 40 hours a week and barely pay the rent. And then um, this latest one had, had another one that I, it's the first time I've ever seen this. But the number of people doing two full-time jobs at the same time is also spiking. And that's also the sign of a really unhealthy economy because very few people if they've got a good full-time job, go out and take another full-time job. That's, uh, you know, that kind of implies your first full-time job wasn't even good enough to pay the, the bills, you know, and, and that's another sign of a weak economy. So had those numbers come out as the headlines, we wouldn't be talking about, oh, great recovery or anything like that. And, and it's only because those numbers are either revised later or else they're buried in these big, long reports. So hardly anybody sees them. So things aren't nearly as good as people think. And, and, well, and then you get Paul Krugman and, the, and these other um, quote unquote experts coming out and saying, you know, I, it, people just don't understand how good the economy is. You've got all this negativity out there, but the unemployment rate is 3.4% and there's all these new jobs. And I think people are just ignorant, you know, and that's why the election is so close because people don't know what a good economy we've got. Well, they're either lying or else they didn't read all the fine print in the jobs report. So I, I don't think you can hide stuff like that forever. And um, I, and that explains why people are relatively pessimistic in a lot of polls, because they're living the revised numbers and the uh, the fine print numbers. You know, their lives are very hard. Um, and it, it's not anything like it should be in an economy with a 3.5 percent unemployment rate and a rapid increase in jobs, you know? So I don't think you can hide that for long because if nothing else, it comes out in politics, even if the economists manage to hide it for a while. And that's that's where we are right now. You know, there's a big disconnect between what they're telling us and the lived reality of a lot of people. And that can't last forever. So John, what about the other data point of inflation that everyone, including central banks, are so focused on What's your outlook for inflation? And when you dive into those numbers, what do you focus on? Well, it, inflation is is slowing down a bit. And that's not a surprise. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to expect deflation in the coming year, because um, especially debt levels, you know, wherever you look, 
debt has spiked and it's especially true for consumers because credit card debt is through the roof and car loans are incredibly expensive and mortgages are crazy expensive and student debt is now having to be paid back and everything and so those are deflationary things right there you know and and uh, so it's not a surprise that inflation is slowing but if you raise prices for day-to-day -day life by 30 percent and then the rate of increase goes down from that point, goes down to 2.5 or 3%, you're still kind of screwed as a consumer, right? Because the, your life is 30% more, more expensive than it was three years ago. Life is much, much harder. And the fact that inflation, the, the rate of increase is down to some small number, doesn't fix things for you. You know, every time you go to the gas station, every well, the gas station is one of the... Uh, one of the probable exceptions to this story. But in general, when you go shopping, life is much more expensive and your rent is way up and your car loan, et cetera, et cetera. So life is much harder. So for inflation to go to zero right now, in other words, for prices to stop going up is not a, a healthy sign of an economy when their prices are 30% higher than where they were three years ago. So the headline numbers don't save us because we're still dealing with the consequences of past year's really bad headline numbers. And, you know, we would have to have literal 30% deflation in order just to get us back to where we were three years ago, which was still not a great time for a lot of people. So things are a mess. <laughs> and the, uh, the, the little improvements in headline numbers won't fix life for most people. And then, and again, that's why politics are, are so surprising to a lot of the experts right now, because life is way harder than um, that. You know, if you're a, um, a millionaire economist living in New York City and working for the New York Times, life is great. And you don't understand what life is like for other people. And until that gets fixed, the world stays very chaotic. And I don't really see any way to fix it pain-free because deflation is painful for another group of people. You know, it makes it easier on consumers, but it makes it terrible for debtors, right? And um, so for us to try to go back to like a sound money regime with no inflation, um, you bankrupt the leveraged speculating community, which is basically most of the world right now. So there are no easy fixes, in other words, and it's going to stay messy. And uh, you guys and I are going to have tons of stuff to talk about going forward all through to 2024. Sure sounds like it, John. Hopefully it's not as bad as everything that uh, we're talking about here, but I guess we'll see how it all plays through the system and how long everything can keep going. I guess the direction it's going, but look, we're focused so much on markets here. Let's see what's sustainable in market moves and let's see if gold actually does move up above just even that 2100 level or even if it makes that move to those much higher levels that you said in three, five, ten years. Who knows? We will be following along with every move, though. So, John, thank you for your time today. Again, we'll post a link to John's Substack below this interview, and John will chat with you again in another couple weeks. Great. Thanks, guys. Talk soon.